thank you all for uh, coming uh, to this lecture of mine and for your welcoming attitude, at least to persons, some of you I spoke already before, uh, before the six. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, yes, those of you who follow the news have seen without any doubt that yesterday the eight billionth child was born on earth. It was big news and the, now from now on officially since yesterday we have eight billion people on earth. Usually we call this collection of human beings humanity. But there is not only humanity in a strict sense, there is also humanity in a broad sense. And I call humanity in a broad sense, including not only the living, but also the dead and the unborn, I call that collection of people, past people, present people and future people, humanity at large. The dead, the living and the unborn, humanity at large. I think it is relatively unproblematical that we can call the multitude of persons that have lived in the past, that are living now and that will live in the future on this earth are a historical community. There is some, there are some ties among all of us, even if, of course, most of them we never, we do not know and we will never know. There is a tie. That tie is historical. We are united by succession in time. We are united by succeeding generations. But there is more. We also, uh, I believe, can say that that uh, humanity at large is a moral community because we inherit um, a legacy of the dead and also they transmit their values and their heritage to us and we at a certain moment will pass it on to future generations. So there is that value thing in the transmission chain that enables me to say that we are not only a historical community but also a moral community. And that if we want to have a good conception of morality, we should include also the past persons and future persons uh, in our scope. Although past people do not speak anymore, and although future persons do not speak yet, and although they are, for that reason, unable to represent themselves. But there have been very clever demographers, like Karl Haug, uh, the foremost of them, who have estimated the number of people who have ever lived on Earth. And Karl Haug has repeated that estimate various times, the last time two years ago, and he said there have been 108 billion people born us. And his reasoning is very sophisticated. I will not go delve into the details here, but he starts with calculating the number of people in the 50,000 years before our, uh, our time, and then um, tries to calculate the number of people that have ever lived. Of these 108 billion, 100 billion are dead and 8 billion alive. The 8 billion figure we know since yesterday, this is also co very correct. Uh, according to United Nations statistici statisticians. And the 100, if you ever have asked yourself how many dead are there, well, the answer is 100 billion. And there have also been demographers who have estimated the number of people that will be born from now today 
uh, and within the next 50,000 years. And at the present speed of procreation. And the number is, the number of future people is 6.75 trillion in the next 50,000 years. Now we are speaking here about um, a, a huge mass and very unequal communities. And the living uh, is in fact the smallest community of the three. If we look at these three uh, groups, then we can also see that there are temporal asymmetries between them. And I identified three. Uh, at, the, at the level of morality, the living have rights and duties. But the dead and the unborn do have neither. They do not have rights and they do not have duties. But if we speak in a language of morality about them, we must say that in a certain sense, and I will try to buttress that thesis in my lecture for the past generations, we must speak about them in a language of respect and protection. Respect, and by which I mean that we as the living have duties of respect and protection towards the dead and the unborn. And these are two very different types of duties. That's the first uh, asymmetry and it ex explains that there is a universal declaration of human rights. But the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is for the living. There is no talk about the dead, no talk about un the unborn in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is a declaration for the living. There is no such Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the dead, nor a human Universal Declaration of Human Rights for, the future, for future persons. That does not exist. Why? That's an interesting question. Uh, and I will deal with it within a second. The fact that there are no rights of the dead and no rights of the, of the unborn does not mean that the living do not have duties. I already told you that in my view, the living have duties of respect and protection towards these two categories. And therefore, it's very instructive that UNESCO uh, 25 years ago, that UNESCO drafted a universal declaration of the duties of the living to future generations. That's a very interesting declaration. The duties, not rights. It's not a universal declaration of rights of future people. It is a universal declaration of duties of the living towards regarding future generations. And inspired by this approach, I myself drafted the Universal Declaration of Duties of the Living Towards Dead Persons, seven years later. And I will show it uh, to you in a minute. But when we compare these two uh, declarations, the UNESCO one and my thing, then we see if you will be astonished, perplexed perhaps, because these two declarations do not have anything in common. Why? because there is a huge difference between the unborn and the dead. Because the dead have lived and they have developed, each of them was once alive and they have developed identities. Each of them was a marked personality. Each of the persons who have lived in the past and are now dead, they had a, a personality. That is not true for the future generations. Those who are yet to be born, they have no identity yet, because they are not yet born. The moral philosopher Derek Parfit called that the non-identity problem of future persons. That's another asymmetry. And the third asymmetry between uh, these three groups is that uh, perhaps the duties, our duties towards past persons, are underestimated in comparison to our duties to future persons because the past is past. It is unalterable. It is 
um, unchangeable and irreversible. And in contrast, the future is open-ended. Everything is possible. This is the realm of plants. And lots, lots of things can happen there. The, in contrast to the future, the past seems rather closed. We can harm future people. We can benefit future people. But our capacity to harm dead people is, in my opinion, non-existent. We cannot harm dead persons anymore. And I also will try to defend that thesis. My thesis is that the dead are not human beings, but past human beings. They are not um, persons, but past persons. And that is very important because um, the, the, the dead uh, do not have the kind of dignity that is associated with living people. Living people have human rights, and when you analyze human rights, for example in the Universal Declaration, you will quickly see that the core concept that summarizes all these human rights is human dignity. That is the core concept of the Universal Declaration. It is also mentioned three or four times uh, in the Declaration itself and in the covenants that are dependent on that Declaration. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on e Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, I think that the dead do not have human dignity because they are not human beings. They have another type of dignity, which I will call posthumous dignity. Um, posthumous dignity. And the posthumous dignity of the dead generate duties for the living, duties of respect and uh, protection. I come back to that. That is my thesis in a nutshell. Now, in contrast to several other philosophers who have written about the dead, I do not assume that the dead have agency. I think if you uh, assume that the dead can act, that you have to prove it. And I have never seen conclusive proof, not, not only conclusive, but also convincing proof, that the dead can act, that the dead have agency. And therefore, I will avoid in my lecture agential concepts such as the soul, such as immortality, such as the spirit, uh, spirits, such as afterlife. I avoid these concepts because I cannot prove them as a scholar. <clears throat> that does not mean the fact that the dead do not have agency does not mean that the dead do not have influence. On the contrary, the dead are very influential because they influence the living substantially. What is left of them are human remains, uh, skeletons, bones, ashes. So in a substantial way, they survive their deaths. Also in a genetical way, genetical way they survive their deaths because their DNA lives on in their offspring. Biographically, they continue to live in the stories about their lives. And materially, they continue to influence us because they left us a legacy on a personal level and a heritage on a more collective level. And therefore, they have an influence. And also, and I'm an historian here, an historian of mentalities, so I am very sensible to the fact that since many people believe that the dead have agency, that in itself is an important fact that you have to reckon with. So the fact that many believe that the dead have agency, are still alive somehow, is an important factor in itself and a sort of influence uh, of, that the dead have on the My definition of the dead is the dead are past human beings or past persons. Very briefly, 
um, you cannot say that the dead are things, are objects. They are not. They cannot be owned, they cannot be sold, they are not a kind of property. Um, the dead are not human beings, uh, or they are not persons, because human beings have needs, human beings or persons have interests, rights and duties, they make claims, and the dead do not have any of that. The dead do not have needs, the dead do not have rights, duties, interests, and they cannot make claims. Therefore, that is a substantial, a very crucial difference with, with human beings. There is one similarity between human beings and the dead, and that is that all the dead, without exception, have once been human beings and have once been persons. And therefore my definition of the dead is the dead are past human beings or past persons. And simple as this definition may seem, um, it has two very important consequences. The fact that the dead are not human beings but past human beings means that they do not have human rights. Because human rights are the privilege, so to say, of human beings. They do not have, the dead do not have human dignity. Because human dignity is the pillar on which all human rights rest. A universal declaration of rights of the dead is a philosophical impossibility. It cannot be written. The dead have a different type of dignity, I maintain, namely, not human dignity, but posthumous dignity. And hence, my title, the title of my lecture, is ridiculously um, tautological. Posthumous dignity of dead persons. Posthumous and dead is twice the same thing. But I cannot escape the tautology, because when I title my lecture, the dignity of dead persons, you may be inclined to think about human dignity. And that is essential for me. The dead do not have human dignity. I maintain they have posthumous dignity. So I have to add a tautological element in my title. And another claim is the fact that the dead are past human beings is that the living have ensuing duties, duties towards the dead, because the dead have uh, posthumous dignity. So the dead have posthumous dignity and therefore the living have duties towards these dead, duties of respect and duties of protection. And I will clarify that consequence, that reasoning, that causality uh, a little bit further now. But first, my, let me ask the question, can I prove that, uh, that the, the dead have posthumous dignity? I think I can. But the proof is not an empirical proof. Why not? Because I cannot take a microphone and interview the dead about how they feel, what they think about their rights, their, their eventual rights, their virtual rights, their, uh, what their opinion is. I cannot. I cannot start an empirical research among the dead. That is impossible. But I can start a phenomenological research uh, about the dead. And how do I do that? I do that by studying how people on earth treat the dead. And that's a phenomenological approach. I observe whether they respect the dead and respect is a consequence, and then I infer, if they respect it, that, that there is something there that, is, that I call posthumous dignity. I postulate that. And um, I also study cases in which that dignity is breached. Cases of indignity. Well, cases of respect for the dead are manifold. You will find proof in anthropology. All people on earth respect their dead. Uh, take any book on anthropology, 
Nigel Barley, for example, or many others who has written a book about the dead in anthropology. There is overwhelming proof that all people, peoples on earth, respect their dead. In archaeology as well, we, we discovered proof of respect for the dead in the prehistoric and protohistoric burial mounds that we found a little bit everywhere. Uh, in whatever form. Rituals of mourning, in by, if we look at human beings biologically, rituals of, of mourning exist in several animals. Elephants, for example, have rituals of mourning. Uh, horses have rituals of mourning. And several other kinds of animals. But the human beings are the only type of animal that has a sustained relationship with their dead. And in law, we can easily um, see that all countries in the world, all 200 of them, have regulations for respect on cemeteries, for respect uh, to, to respect funerals, etc. That is regulated by law in all countries of the world. And at an international level, Take, for example, the International Red Cross and the International Humanitarian Law. When you study the Geneva Conventions, you will see that huge parts of the Geneva Conventions are dedicated to uh, the casualties, the dead casualties of war, those who died in war. Huge parts of IHL are devoted to that. And the uh, Geneva Conventions are treaties that are ratified universally. All countries in the world have ratified the four Geneva Conventions that include these uh, stipulations the, um, of respect for the dead. Also, my phenomenological research into indignity leads me to the same conclusion. Because when the posthumous dignity of the dead is breached, then there is a general outrage, uh, a feeling that this is a shame, and that, um, that um, if a corpse is mutilated or a, um, a, a burial site is desecrated, then it shocks the conscience of humanity. And it's not for nothing that the mutilation of corpses and the uh, desecration of cemeteries have been recognized as crime, war crimes by the International Criminal Court. So we see there is a lot of indirect, uh, inferred evidence for the existence of posthumous dignity. The evidence for respect for the dead is overwhelming. The abhorrence for indignities is also universal. And therefore, I think the best way to understand this quasi-universal attitude of respect is to postulate a, a, a characteristic of the dead that I call posthumous dignity. That posthumous dignity generates duties. Um, and these, are, uh, these duties are duties of respect and protection. Who bears the duties towards the dead? Well, Everybody, I think, all the living have duties of respect uh, towards the dead. That's a collective, it's a collective duty. Well, whoever is dead, you have to respect that fact. You cannot disturb a funeral, you cannot uh, disturb a, a cemetery, etc., etc. We have, all of us, without exception, we have duties of respect. This is different for the other time, duties of Protection, to protect the dead, is a duty that is assigned to only a few people, namely the near and dear of the dead persons in question. The near and the dear and all those who are involved in the fate of some of the dead persons. For example, community caretakers, physicians, um, forensic anthropologists, um, then state-level guardians like truth commissions, 
tribunals who deal with atrocity crimes. The specific groups in society have uh, act as representatives of the dead and they perform duties of protection. And this is different for every dead person. Is this depends on the circles that are involved in the fate of that particular person. So there is a very big difference between our duty to respect the dead and our duty to protect some of them. Who are the beneficiaries of the duties? I hope I do not shock you, but the beneficiaries of our duties to the dead are not the dead themselves. Because the dead, they, in my opinion, in my view, in my reasoning, my theory, they do not feel anything. They do not have agency. They are unaware of any duties that are being performed on their behalf. So the, du the duty, the dead are not the beneficiaries of the duties to the, to the dead. The duties, in, in contrast, they comfort the surviving family members and others who have known the dead. And they comfort also society at large. So the beneficiaries of the duties to the dead are the living. In, in small circles, but also in the most, in the broadest circle possible. And these two types of duties, I can break them down in more specific duties. And as I told you, I tried to draft a universal declaration of duties of the living to the dead. And I will navigate you through it you, so that you have a flavor of what I have tried to do without going into detail. Because each of the duties I identify, and I identify two main types, respect and protection, but eight specific types. They are worth a commentary for each for an hour. Um, I can assure you that. But I see that, the, uh, first of all, that we have a duty to identify the dead. We have the dead, we have to try to identify the dead. Duty of them, to search for them and to identify the dead. This is one of the most prominent articles in the Geneva Conventions. If there is a war and you have to search, you have to search for the dead. That's a command. Search. And I try to identify them. But then you know who they are. And all the other, it's the most important duty, I think. Identify the dead. And then we have body-related duties to the dead. And that's, uh, I think, very straightforward. You have a duty to respect the body, the corpse. You have a duty to um, organize some kind of last service, a funeral, if you like, the scattering of ashes, a ceremony. And you have a duty to dispose of the remains, uh, either by cremation or burial. Then you have personality-related duties to the dead. You have to be aware that you cannot show the dead in any. Uh, uh, you cannot show any image of the dead. You should always balance whether the image you show of the dead does not disturb their privacy or reputation. Because this is a tricky part of my reasoning. The dead do not have a right to privacy. They do not have a right to reputation. But they do have a reputation, and they do have. A Privacy. They have privacy as a characteristic of posthumous dignity. They have re a reputation as a characteristic of posthumous dignity. But they do not have rights to reputation, no, not rights to uh, privacy as the living have. Privacy and reputation are uh, incorporated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 12. That is not applicable to the dead. But we have a duty to balance whether what we show about the dead and when we speak about the dead, whether that can, uh, whether that um, uh, is, is whether that is more important than their uh, than their privacy 
in the reputation. If it is, uh, then you, we should uh, enjoy our freedom of expression as historians and write about the dead. And I also maintain that the presumption here is in favor of freedom of expression, not in favor of the privacy and re reputation of the dead. It, the presumption is in disclosing facts about the dead. The presumption is in divulging information about the dead. But what I think is necessary is that each historian balances whether what we say about the dead, intimate details that can affect their privacy and reputation, are worth mentioning in our works or not. There are also legacy-related uh, duties. Uh, duties related to the legacy is all duties related to um, the last will, to the testament. And these are issues of copyright, posthumous copyright, uh, the, the issues of messenet, issues of, uh, uh, um, of recu also reputation, and uh, very complicated in law. This is a, a very special posthumous copyright. is a very uh, developed branch of, of uh, intellectual property law. Uh, heritage, we also have a duty to safeguard the heritage that the dead bequeathed on us, on us. I also maintain that in order to uh, fulfill these duties, we need two rights. A right to, to uh, history, that is a right to know what happened with dead persons when they died and before they died, especially when they were victims of human rights violations, when they were victims, victims of atrocities such as genocide or crimes against humanity. We have a, to, to say this in the human rights vocabulary, we have a right to the truth. The right to the truth is an emergent human right that is discussed now all over the world in human rights circles, in international courts, uh, in the international criminal court. It's very <coughs> important. We have a right to know what happened to victims of atrocities more general to how people died, in which circumstances. We also have a right to memory, a right to pay our last respect to the dead, to commemorate them, to mourn them in private, or to commemorate them in public. And you will see uh, these two rights are offsprings of general human rights. Article 19, the right to freedom of expression, Article 20, the right to freedom of association for funerals, for uh, public commemorations. These are rights firmly in, enshrined in the Universal Declaration. I think that the right to history, as I call it, and the right to memory are children of the broader right to freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of assembly. This is in a nutshell my universal declaration of the duties of the living to the dead. Now I will reflect a little bit more on that concept of posthumous dignity. That is, uh, at least that is what I want to do in the next five or six minutes. And afterwards, Lisa, you should tell me if I, have, if I still have time or because I can also develop other points. I have 14 slides. In total, this is only slide nine, and there are some tough slides to come. Okay, but still, I want to discuss with you the nature of posthumous dignity. As I told you already, posthumous dignity is not a right of the dead. It is a characteristic. It is the dimension. It is a property of the dead, not a right. With aspects that posthumous dignity has aspects, aspects of identity, aspects of uh, body, aspects of personality, aspects of legacy. And it has also, it is expressed as privacy. For example, when you see a corpse uh, at an, in a cemetery, there is some kind of, uh, it's very difficult to explain, but all people feel some, uh, feel that there is some privacy there left over in that dead person. The dead person enjoyed the right to privacy, but still when you look at the dead body, 
there you have also that same feeling. I do, you do not touch it, that, touch it in a disrespectful way that invades the privacy of the dead. If you do, people are outraged. Okay, it's a dimension, not a right. It is non-discriminatory. All the dead in all of history do have posthumous dignity, without exception. It is applicable to all the dead. And moral merit does not play a role. Even the worst offenders, the worst tyrants, when they are dead, they have posthumous dignity. You cannot uh, do whatever you like with a dead body. Of course, this is a point of principle. This does not mean that in practice you cannot administer the duty of protection of, for example, dead tyrants or dead torturers or mass murderers. You can prevent easily, without any problem, you can prevent public commemorations of a Hitler or a Stalin. Um, it, the fact that they have posthumous dignity does not mean that you cannot regulate and balance the, that posthumous dignity against uh, the rights of the living. Rights uh, to safeguard public order, for example. Non-discriminatory. Failing over time. That's a difficult one. Because in principle and theory, all the dead of history, the whole 100 billion of dead persons in world history from the very beginning until today, they all have posthumous dignity, but uh, um, it is the, the respect for posthumous dignity has not been historically universal. Not at all. The ascription of posthumous dignity has varied a lot uh, across history and across countries. It depends on the era about which we talk and about the place where we are and the perspective we have. And of course, of these 100 billion dead, we only have knowledge of a very few money, very few group, very small group. The famous dead, the the uh, the famous dead, the rich dead, those who, who in a certain way left sources, that's the dead who we know. But the mass of dead, the mass of people who have ever lived on earth, we do not have any information about. In principle then, posthumous dignity has no time bar. It is, it's applicable to all the dead, but in practice, the, the duties of protection disappear because there is nothing to care for anymore and, uh, except in a very abstract way in our works as historians or as uh, moral philosophers when we think about the dead when we write about them this of course can encompass also the dead the, the remote dead of history but in practice the duties of protection disappear. The duties of respect also practically disappear. The posthumous dignity is a relative quality, not an absolute quality. That means that these duties that we have towards the dead are not absolute. They have to be balanced. I already said this. They are not uh, applicable without any reservation. You have to balance them against other interests. Uh, and there are exceptions to many rules. Um, for example, the duty to respect the dead body can easily be uh, trespassed in a war situation where you have to act quickly. Then you leave the dead body in a disrespectful way in order to survive yourself then the balance is very clear. You have to save your own life, even if that means that you cannot pay the last respect to your dead colleague soldier. Um, so there is a question of balance. The duties are not absolute, they are relative. They are uh, amenable to balance. And finally, 
posthumous dignity is not an intrinsic characteristic of the dead. It's something that we read into them, that we attribute to the dead, at least that I attribute to them. And I must say that my conception of posthumous dignity is, has been embraced more and more by forensic anthropologists who excavate um, sites of mass atrocity. They find that a very interesting concept. So I'm not alone. Uh, to, to, uh, to reassure you, uh, I think that posthumous dignity is not an intrinsic property of the dead. It is not a property of the dead that becomes awake each time we enter into contact with them. I think we attribute it. And why do we do this? Why do we attribute posthumous dignity to the, to the dead? We do it for a selfish reason. A selfish reason. Because then we see if we respect the dead, that our chances to be respected ourselves after our deaths increases. So posthumous dignity of the dead serves as a social institution. If you would see that testaments, last wills, are violated continuously, then why should you bother of writing a testament, of drawing up a last will? If you see that they are not honored, if you see that uh, uh, dead bodies are mutilated, why would you uh, restrain yourself from doing Why would you expect that people would respect your body once you're dead, when you see mutilation of corpses all the time? So there is a very social element here, and we attribute posthumous dignity, uh, and the attribution contributes to the organization of society. It is a norm, and we cultivate a norm of, of peace, social peace, a norm of civility, in the expectation that once it is our turn, once we die, that we will be treated with respect ourselves. I have two more uh, issues, breaches of uh, posthumous dignity and reparation of posthumous dignity, but I do not want to overstep my time. It's seven, I, ten minutes I can. But... Maybe you can have five minutes. Okay, then I walk to the remaining slides. Well, I have a problem with breaches of posthumous dignity. How should we label them? That is a semantic minefield. Then are breaches of posthumous dignity, are there harms, are there wrongs, offenses, abuses, violations? But the dead do not feel anything. They cannot be harmed. The dead cannot be violated. The dead cannot be abused. The dead cannot be offended. At the same time, when the, the posthumous dignity is breached, there is a shock in each of us. And it is an outrage for us. In, in, in uh, war crime terminology, violations, mutilations of corpses and, and breaches of cemeteries, uh, the desecration of graves, are called, the technical term is, outrages upon the dignity of dead persons. That's an official legal term, outrages upon the dignity of dead persons. An, an official urid, urid, legal concept used by the International Criminal Court for which offenders are punished regularly uh, 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 before the, the International Criminal Court and many other courts. Um, I once drafted a list of breaches of posthumous dignity and I had, I had a list of more or less 60 breaches. And then I think about the war crime of mutilation of dead bodies or, or desecration of cemeteries. I think of the enforced disappearance, the abduction of people. Then you kill them anonymously and nobody, and then the, without reappearance of the body, that's a crime against humanity, according to the International Criminal Court. 
You have also the intentional destruction of cultural heritage, which occurs in wartime, Ukraine, for example, which occurs in times of genocide, the Uyghurs, the heritage of the Uyghurs in China, which occurs in times of peace, the destruction of mosques in India. And that is also, uh, when it occurs in wartime, it's a war crime, an official war crime. Who is a victim of the breaches of posthumous dignity? Here again, my answer is the same as always, not the dead. The dead are not victims of the indignities, indignities inflicted upon them. It is the surviving families, it is the friends, humanity as a whole, who are the victims. Because posthumous dignity breaches, they disturb their duties and their, their right to memory. Breaches are motivated. That's a very interesting field for us. Why do people mutilate dead, dead bodies? Why do they desecrate cemeteries? And the summary of their reasons are either to punish the dead although the dead cannot be punished, people believe that they can punish the dead, or to deter the living beyond the mutilation of the corpse. They want, the, the real target is, are the living. They want to deter the living, the surviving family, or they want to humiliate them. My final point is the restoration of uh, posthumous dignity. Here I will make it, I will not navigate to, to every point here, but um, uh, let me say the following. The restoration of posthumous dignity, my approach here is very much inspired by the conception of reparation as uh, defended by the United Nations. The United Nations has a principles of reparation agreed by the General Assembly in 2005. And this is the supreme body of the United Nations. Well, when you look at these United Nations reparation principles, you will see that most of the reparations enumerated there are not applicable to the dead. You cannot, uh, uh, you cannot restitute the harm to the dead because they are dead. You cannot compensate the dead for the harm you have done to them. You cannot rehabilitate them, send them to a clinic, and you cannot, uh, the, uh, the reparation of prevention of non-reoccurrence is impossible because they are not there anymore. There is only one type of reparation that is partly applicable to the dead, and it's called satisfaction or symbolic reparation. Symbolic reparation, reparation in symbolical ways, is one type of the broader package of reparation principles as seen, perceived by the United Nations. Um, you have several types of symbolic reparation, um, and here I will go through it very quickly as well. You can search for facts, for the truth, the right to the truth about the dead, you can search for their bodies, you can restore their reputations posthumously, you can issue apologies, acknowledge uh, atrocities of the past, you can commemorate and, and uh, organize tributes to the dead, and you can uh, manage that history textbooks uh, contain uh, adequate, accurate, uh, uh, responsible versions of past atrocities. My conclusion, what is the impact of um, posthumous dignity? I think that uh, if you restore, if posthumous dignity is breached and then restored, you can contribute to several important things. First of all, substantially, you can comfort the survivors by honoring posthumous dignity, by repairing it if it is breached. You, it brings comfort to 
uh, the surviving relatives and society. You can help um, discontinue historical injustice by pointing to lies about the dead. For example, the, the crime of denial of genocide. You, you can fight this. You can struggle against Holocaust denial, the denial of the Rwandan genocide, the denial of the Armenian genocide, the denial of the Holodomor, the denial of the sexual slavery system during the Pacific War. All these atrocities have their deniers. You can fight against this. And then you help discontinue historical injustice by combating these denials. Socially, you can raise awareness um, of historical injustice, and this adds to prevention. And politically, each time you use your right of freedom of expression in, in the domains of history and theory uh, of history and memory, each time you use them, you strengthen a democratic historical awareness. And therefore, you also indirectly strengthen democracy as a political system. Therefore, the use of our rights to protect the dignity of the dead has also important political consequences. I believe that posthumous dignity is a thesis that best explains how we should behave towards the dead. And I, therefore, I developed a golden rule, very much inspired, of course, on the Bible's golden rule, and the golden rule in many cultures is the same. And my transliteration is, do unto the dead as you would have others do unto you after you die. Thank you very much.